Welcome to the Canadian Business Quarterly Podcast, where we speak with Canada's most influential industry leaders on the business and economic development issues taking place across the country. You can stay up to date with all of our content, including our publications, newsletters, and podcasts by visiting www.thecbq.ca and clicking on subscribe. The Brothers of Bargains, also known as Andrew and Doug McIver, are the head and the heart at Ride Time, an independent dealership in Winnipeg, Manitoba. As third-generation car dealers, Andrew and Doug have been around vehicle dealerships all of their lives. The brothers have leveraged technology, social media, and video content to create a brand that is known across North America. They were subjects of a national reality TV show called Bargain Brothers and are both recipients of Auto Remarketing Canada's 40 Under 40 Award. So, Doug and Andrew, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, who are we going to speak with first? Do you want to give us uh, an overview of Ride Time? Yeah, so I'm Andrew, and uh, Ride Time uh, really started with my dad and I uh, back in 2007. Uh, I started it with my dad after I graduated from uh, Georgian College, and we really wanted to recreate uh, start from scratch. If, if we didn't have uh, a franchise dealer to, you know, kind of tell us what to do, how could we recreate the business? And we've done that uh, a bunch of different ways with some of our unique processes. And uh, it's been it's been a wild journey since 2007. Yeah, Andrew and I are third generation car dealers. At one point, we did have six franchise stores in our family. Our father also at one time was the largest Chrysler dealer in Canada by volume. Uh, so yeah, we do have a long history in the auto industry. I, I'm going to ask about how you both, you know, got involved with the automotive business. But I remember when we were originally talking about this, Doug, is, is that you were saying, you know, oftentimes you get a little bit hampered by the franchise model. And that's what sort of um, brought your family to go forward and become independent. Do you want to just uh, shed a little bit of light on that? Yeah, for sure. There's a, there's a funny story. Uh, we used to go to, my family used to go to movies as, as a kid or as kids, and there was a uh, used car dealership in front of one of the movie theaters that was close to our house, and it was the equivalent of what a dirt lot would have been. Okay. And uh, my dad had told my brother, you know, one day, he said, that's the dream. And Andrew had said, you know, what do you mean that's a dream? You have the most beautiful dealership, you know, in the city. Because at the time, our dad uh, was one of the first dealers to put a, a restaurant inside of his dealership in Toronto. And uh, to us, it was a little bizarre, but what my dad had said, is he was tired of the handcuffs that the franchise model put around you from uh, marketing or choosing what inventory you had to carry. And you know, to him, having a used car dealership where you're 100% in charge of your future, uh, that was really appealing to him. Now, I mean, it's a multi-generational business, but do you gentlemen want to tell me your individual stories about how you, you know, stayed involved with the industry? Yeah, so I, and this is Andrew speaking, I knew that I wanted to be in the car business my whole life. I've had a passion for it. I remember at six years old, begging my dad to allow me to come into work on Saturdays. And my first job in the dealership at six years old was a greeter. And I stood by the front door and anyone that walked in the door, I would thank them for coming to visit my dad and hope that they'd buy a car that day. Right. And, uh, you know, from there, it, it morphed into answering the phones every once in a while. And as soon as I got my driver's license, I was there washing cars and, and driving cars around. And, uh, you know, I took one year in between high school and, and university just to make sure that I really wanted to be in the business because uh, I felt blessed my whole life that I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, I, and I always thought it would be a shame that you would go through, you know, four years of post-secondary education to get out and find that you hated what you did every day. And uh, so I, I feel truly blessed from the age of six years old that I knew I wanted to be in the car business. And, you know, that's something that I get to do every day. I myself didn't know that I wanted to be in the car business. Uh, I followed a different path. I, I played uh, major junior hockey in Canada for four years and then uh, nine years of professional hockey, six in the minors um, in the U.S. and then three years overseas in Europe. Uh, but I got to join the family in 2000, the family business in 2010. I came back to support uh, and help out my brother and my dad. And um, the car business is an, an interesting industry because no two days are, are the same. There's always uh, challenges, you know, like we're experiencing now. But 
um, there's ups and downs forever, and it's it's an exciting, exhilarating industry to be involved in. A lot of people are are going to know you guys, as I mentioned in the introduction, as the the brothers of Bargain. Do you want to just explain this sort of uh, you know rebranding and, and what that did for you? Yeah, in 2012, our, our father unfortunately passed away. He went to, went home and and uh, fell asleep and never woke up. Uh, my brother and I were thrust into uh, to being in charge. We had one of the last decisions our father had made before he passed away was we hired an advertising agency um, out of New York, and they were going to help us uh, with digital marketing and and some different things. Uh, when our when our dad passed away, we had a meeting with them, and they said, "You know what, guys, you got to brand yourselves. You guys are in charge now." And um, in conjunction with them, we you know we came up with the Brothers of Bargains. There was some interesting conversation because Bargain Brothers sounds like you know you're selling you know junky cheap stuff right yeah. but the brothers of bargains provide value and deals so um that was basically it we know we ended up going on uh starting some tv commercials we did some interesting things where you know most dealers or people businesses in general run the same ad for you know a quarter or half a year some of them run full years uh we were running one new commercial uh every month uh, which created a uh, an interesting kind of following, like our own little mini TV show at the time. Okay. And uh, our brand was propelled from there. So what do you guys see as, as your difference? Like, I mean, for most people, they may not see a lot of difference between buying a car from dealership to dealership, but you've obviously, you know, carved out uh, a niche for yourselves. Yeah. And, you know, this is one thing I talk about a lot. Uh, the automotive industry s- suffers from a perception issue. And if you dig into that, uh, you know, my, my firm belief is one of the biggest problems that, that traditional dealerships have is they force customers into their sales process and their sales process is developed to benefit the dealership, not necessarily to benefit the customer. And, you know, the one thing that we talk about a lot is we talk that our competition, not necessarily the dealer down the street, we compete daily with the perceptions of our customers in other industries that they deal with. You know, the, the best example of that is Amazon. Amazon has spent hundreds of millions of dollars to reduce any friction that it, it, it exists in the sales process. And if you're forcing your customers through a traditional sales process at a dealership, you are creating friction and that friction hampers the customer experience. So we really, when we uh, created this business, we said, listen, if we could do anything differently, what would we do? And what we really tried to create is a customer first business. And that means that, you know, when you come into the dealership, you have one single point of contact. You're not bouncing around from this person that has to go talk to a manager that once, you know, the manager comes out and talks to you, and maybe you talk to six people before you're able to buy a car. We really want a customer to build a relationship with one uh, point of contact that they don't have to worry about telling their story all over again or, or uh, you know, re-explaining themselves. They get to deal with one person and that's who's going to look into their best interest. And all of our uh, salespeople are non-commissioned, which means the customer can have, you know, the peace of mind that whatever we're trying to help them with, is the best fit for them, not necessarily the vehicle that makes the salesperson the most money. Yeah, the only other thing I'll mention, you know, differences, uh, we do offer complimentary oil changes for life. So as long as you own the vehicle, you do, uh, you do get uh, your oil changes covered inside of our, our service department. But we really, to, to touch on what Andrew said about the customer experience, we heavily focus on merchandising our, our inventory, um, which allows our consumers from no matter where they are in the world to ha- see, you know, 40 plus high definition uh, f- uh, photos of each vehicle, as well as uh, videos of the vehicle. And we have three different 360 immersive views of each each piece of our inventory. Because when we built our new facility five, six years ago now, I guess, um, we actually built the dealership around this, a state of the art photo studio. So we can take, you know, no matter what the weather is like outside, we can take unbelievable uh, video and, and uh, photo content of all of our inventory. 
I mean, that sounds pretty cool. And I wanted to ask you guys how you, how you grew the business. But what was interesting to me is, is, you know, when I think of automotive dealerships, I sort of think that they might have a radius of, say, 10 to 20 kilometers where they service the local area. But you guys are selling not only across the country. I believe that you told me that you are also doing international sales as well. And that sounds crazy to me from an automotive dealership. So do you want to just, you know, give us a bit of insight into that? Yeah. And it all goes back to uh, video and the power of video. And, you know, truthfully, how we've been able to grow our our business has been through video. So at this point, we've got uh, millions of views on our YouTube page. And that really had to do with us making a video of each vehicle that we have for sale. And we started posting that on our our YouTube channel. And, you know, our, our viewership had grown from there. And I think it's twofold. I think it's the power of the internet being able to shrink the world that if someone's looking for something, they can reach out to all the way from Germany because we sold the truck into Germany. They can reach out to a used car dealer in the middle of Canada and say, hey, I saw this truck on YouTube. Uh, can I buy it? Mm. And that's that's the power of A, the internet and B, I think that's the power that we were able to leverage the technology that we had available to us to help facilitate some of those sales. Yeah, we've sold cars in the the Bahamas, uh, Lebanon, tons and tons into the US, all through the Northwest Territories. It's it's been really remarkable, you know, for us to be located where we are to be able to as my brother just touched on shrink the world. You know, the one part too that really has helped us allow us to grow our customer base. Um, we are we joke that we're addicted to technology. One of the interesting parts is the way we price our inventory too through a third-party technology partner to make sure that we are the most competitive price out there. Obviously, if you're shopping from different parts of the world, right, you got to have a reason why you're going to do business with somebody. Um, so on top of the transparency that we provide with all of the content that we provide on each vehicle, you know, our, our pricing is uh, second to none really in, in normal times. Yeah, right. Um, you know, as, as we begin to wrap up uh, you know, we know sort of COVID has hit. Hopefully we're beginning to get out of this. But I mean, I think that's caused a lot of industry issues that are taking place. Do you want to just kind of give us a peek on, on what's happening within automotive? Yeah, you know, the, the big thing in the buzzword is uh, chip shortage, chip supplies, chip constraints, right? Um, uh, you know, we met with our team at the beginning of this and we said, guys, I just want everyone to be clear of how used cars are, are created. Used cars are created from rental car companies. Uh, repos and lease returns, um, and they're created when uh, a vehicle is sold. So a lot of new car sales have used car trade-ins, and that's how these used cars are created. Well, if new car supply is off or non-existent, there's going to be no, you know, trade-ins. Um, in Canada, the government did a pretty decent job actually of protecting people and making sure that they were pumping the economy of, of uh, you know, fiat currency which uh, repo rates had actually dropped to some of the lowest rates they'd seen in a long time. So there weren't any repo rates coming or repos coming back. Uh, traveling globally, uh, you know, came to a screeching halt. Um, manufacturers quit selling rental car companies um, vehicles because they just didn't have enough to supply their own retail customers. Uh, so there were no rentals coming back. So when you combine all those three things, it's really put a constraint on uh, supply. And also, obviously, if new car dealers don't have new cars to sell, they're going to get more heavily active into uh, the used car market because new car dealers typically carry about 70% of their used car um, inventory as trade-ins. And, you know, 30% approximately is they're going to have to go source on their own. So when they don't have those trade-ins, they're also fishing in the same ponds that independent dealers such as ourselves are. Mm. Um, you know, we had, had some great hopes going into 2022 that this would be resolved. However, it's looking like this is going to be pushed into 2023. Okay. Um, I guess perhaps hopefully on a brighter note before we finish, is there anything else that you might like to discuss? Yeah. You know, and it's interesting. We, on a brighter note, what we do find is, you know, the price of a new car has gotten so, so expensive. Interestingly enough, I was crunching some numbers since 2017 the average uh, new car price. Now these are American numbers. I don't have access to the Canadian numbers, but you know, mm. U.S. and Canada really uh, follow pretty closely in terms of pricing. The average new car price is now up eleven thousand five hundred and eighty-one dollars since two thousand seventeen, or roughly thirty-three percent. The funny part about that is 
that number in 2017 was up 35% in the last 20 years. What that means is new car prices have gotten so expensive, which, you know, you're going to push a lot of people out of that new car market, right? And with coming rising interest rates, vehicles are about to get even more expensive when you're paying more money to to, uh, service that loan. So what we find is we think that's going to be a, a, a really good opportunity for us as an independent to be able to sell more people vehicles because they just they they're going to be priced out of the new car market. Yeah, and the you know someone said to me a couple of weeks ago they said who's going to buy gas if it gets to two dollars a liter? Mm. And the truth is anyone who needs to drive, right? Yeah. And. Uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, you know, vehicles in general are a need, especially in the prairies. Um, you know, we, we are, you travel greater distances. Consumers still need vehicles. We made a commitment that we were always going to stock inventory. We've done our best to keep our inventory levels high because people in our community and, and across the country are going to need used cars. And we really see going forward that the, you know, that cost analysis that families are going to sit down and do are going to say, man, it, it just doesn't make sense for me to pay $80,000, $90,000 for a pickup truck, right? When the value proposition is is really shifted uh, to that used car market and we'll be eagerly waiting to facil- facil- or facilitate the needs of our, our growing customer base. Well, Doug and Andrew, uh, it's, it's been insightful and I appreciate your time today. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. This has been a production of the Canadian Business Quarterly, a division of Romulus Rising Proprietary Limited. All rights reserved. You can stay up to date with the Canadian Business Quarterly, including our publications, newsletters, and podcasts by visiting www.thecbq.ca and clicking on subscribe.